Church, I'm Lee. Let's go ahead and get caught up on everything that's going on here at EBFC. As always, we'd like to begin our service by welcoming all of our first-time guests and visitors. And if it is your first time with us this morning and we'd like to connect with you, so we'd love for you to reach in front of you at the seat back and grab the card that has two QR codes on it. One of those QR codes you can scan with your phone and it'll take you to our online visitor form that you can fill out to let us know that you are attending today. You can also flip that card over and fill it out manually just to let us know your basic information because we'd like to follow up with you. If you haven't stopped by the help desk yet, we would like for you to stop by there after the service because we have a gift just for you to say thanks for joining us today. We're going to get a big update from Pastor Bill next Sunday about where we stand on all of our projects with our capital campaign. So you can still give to that, and we'd love to continue to encourage you to do that till the end of the year. If you want more information about that, there should be a card in front of you that you can actually look at and find the basic information about our capital campaign. And if you would like to donate and give specifically to the capital campaign, you can always mark your offering envelopes with capital campaign, or you can find a drop-down in our online menu to give. It's the second Sunday of the month, which means it's time for our next Sunday evening service. Just a reminder, that is an all-family service. We don't have child care, but we'd love to encourage everybody to attend, starting here at 5 p.m. Just an opportunity to come and sing a song of worship and dig into some really deep biblical truths that we believe here at EBFC. It's almost Thanksgiving, and once we're past that, we know it's time for all of our Christmas plans. We've got a few things that are coming up in December specifically related to Christmas. One of those is the Christmas Jubilee, which we're going to give you some real detailed information about that next week. But we wanted to make sure you put it on your calendars, which is December 4th here at the church at 5 p.m. It's going to be a great night of just celebrating Christmas, hearing some carols, watching children put on a play for us, and more. The next thing that we have, obviously, is our Christmas Eve candlelit service, which is what we get to do every year. We gather together, celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ. That service is also going to be at 5 p.m. here at the church on that Saturday evening. So make sure you mark your calendars for that. And finally, because Christmas Day is on a Sunday, we're actually going to be having a Christmas Day service. It's actually going to be an unplugged service, a little bit more traditional, where we're not going to actually do anything with the projection screens, and we'll get to use our hymnals. We're really excited about this, and we hope that you can make time to celebrate on Christmas Day the birth of Jesus Christ with us. Hey everyone, we've got a busy weekend here at Exeter BFC next weekend. It starts on Saturday, November 19th at 10 a.m. will be our next Ladies Connections event. It's a cookie swap, so you won't want to miss out on that. All the details for that can be found in today's e-bulletin. You can also stop by the welcome desk in the main lobby on your way out today and get all the information that you need for that and sign up as well. They are asking everybody to sign up and state what kind of cookies they're going to bring. We want to make sure we have a good variety of cookies. So again, that's next this Saturday at 10 a.m. in the church cafeteria. That is also our last Ladies Connections event for 2022. So make sure you are a part of that. The next day, Sunday, November 20th, our Operation Christmas Child boxes are due. So if you've been working on collecting items for those boxes, please make sure you bring them with you to church next Sunday. There'll be a table in the main lobby for you to put the boxes on, and then we'll take them to the drop-off location on Monday. So don't forget to bring in your boxes next Sunday. Then next Sunday night, the 20th, at 5 p.m. is our annual Night of Thanks service. It'll be a short service where we get together and we sing some songs of praise and thanks. There'll be a time to share some testimonies about the goodness of God and just some things that he's done for you over this past year as we reflect on the Thanksgiving time of year. And then afterwards, we'll meet over in the cafeteria for a pie fellowship. So bring pie or some kind of sweets that you'd like to share with everybody. So that's all next weekend that we're gearing up for that. Make sure you see your e-bulletin for all the details because you don't want to miss out on anything. That's everything that we have for today, but obviously there's so much more, and there's a lot more details that we may not have been able to go over here in this video. I'd like to encourage you to always check out our e-bulletin, which you can scan that same card that has two QR codes, and one of those specifically takes you to our e-bulletins, which is on our website at www.exeterbfc.org slash bulletins. One other special thing we'd like to do for today is because it's Veterans Day weekend, we wanted to take a moment to celebrate and remember and recognize all of those who have served.
morning again. Before we wanted to get started with worship and our meet and greet and everything, we wanted to actually go ahead and take a moment here in person to honor our veterans. So um, I would really love for those of you who have served in our um, U.S. military, we'd just like to take a moment, ask you to stand if you're able, and we can uh, honor you with a round of applause. Thank you all for your service. Um, as the worship team comes forward, we're going to go ahead and get uh, ready, but we'd love for you guys to stand and greet your neighbor if you're up for it.
continue to sing as we declare that our God is the one who fights our battles. continue to sing of our Lord. Join us as we sing the hymn, Ferris, Lord Jesus.
let's have the let's have the men come up for our offering. And uh, I'll have a prayer, guys. Let's ask God for help. God, please help us. Help each one of us, each one of us here this morning. Give us all wisdom and understanding, <clears throat> and and give us more than this, Lord. Give us, give us uh, the desire not just to be hearers of the word, but doers. And when we examine our lives and and all of the things we're facing, the, the struggles and the difficulties and the confusion and pain. And when we examine the, the world and how it, it seems to be broken, Lord, just help us to remember the cross. Help us to remember what was done there. Help us to remember the, the path that you laid out the way of peace, for you are the God of peace and the Prince of peace. We thank you, Lord, and we love you. And this morning, help Pastor Bill, grant him remembrance, and bring all of his hard work to completion here this morning. And as a church, Lord, may we continue to be a pillar and foundation of the truth. In the midst of a dying world, may we be a light and a beacon of hope. And all of us, all of us who comprise this church, Lord, may we steadily and continually learn to seek first your kingdom, to seek first your kingdom. And we give our offering for, for that very reason, not for ourselves, but for your kingdom and for your glory. May your will be done, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Would you all please stand and sing, O oh, Worship the King?
Good morning. So, I've got a lot to go through this morning. So I want to jump into it, but considering it's actually relevant to the uh, sermon, does anybody know what the word ineffable means, ineffable love? Like literally, does anybody? Not effable? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Jack. And on that note, we'll just, we're done. So um, there, there's some kind of deeper terms we'll talk about today. Um, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to define them for you. And I think sometimes we read through the Bible and we come across these terms like propitiation, um, atonement, justification, reconciliation, redemption, things like that. What, what, what does it mean? And so I want to talk about that today. Um, we're going to pray and we're going to get started. Like I said, we have a lot to go through. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we trust you. Lord, you're worthy of it. You're a good God in control of all things. Thank you for that promise through your word. Lord, I pray today as we look at your son's death on the cross that you would speak through me, or Lord, that I would uh, speak truth through your word. Um, Lord, thank you for the opportunity to gather together and worship you. Again, Lord, I pray that anything that's of me today is immediately forgotten, but that your word would cut through uh, our sin nature, our hearts, and Lord, that we would apply it for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. So there's this old phrase, I, I don't know where it started, I probably could have Googled it, though I don't know if you can trust Google, um, it says, and this is just, it's uh, appropriate for Veterans Weekend, but also does kind of relate to what we're going to talk about today, but um, there's a phrase, all gave some, some gave all, so all gave some would probably be more your, your Veterans Day, and some gave all would be your Memorial Day. Uh, I think there's a lot of phrases that we have in our whole life that we just hear spoken a lot of times, and yet we don't really think what's the meaning behind them, or maybe we understand kind of some of the meaning, but not in the same depth as other people. And so I certainly, in my time in the military, and especially the way that I got myself in trouble and all those things, uh, did not have the full experience of what that phrase means and can mean, um, but I did kind of get a glimpse, and, and I was reminded of it this weekend, or this past week, I was talking at my daughter's class, and uh, just to kind of give you an idea of what I'm talking about, in the Marines, they now do a thing, it's called the Crucible, you have to, it's like the final thing you do before you graduate, and you're able to be called a Marine instead of a, a recruit, and um, you stay up for, for 52, 56 hours, something like that, and during that time, you have to go, uh, there's a, a set portion of um, you go through different stations, if you will, of Medal of Honor winners, and you learn about them as you have throughout your whole boot camp. You learn about, like, uh, Smedley Butler and Chesty Poehler and Dan Daly and all these different guys that have won the Medal of Honor and different things they've done in the Marine Corps. And it's one thing to hear about it, and it's another thing for what they try to do in the Crucible is they actually make you reenact certain parts of them. So you have to do what that person did, um, minus typically the sacrifice of your actual life. And so in one of them, you have to uh, do what a guy did over in World War II. He had run out of ammo, and so he had to fight in one stationary position without any ammunition, hand-to-hand -hand combat for 30 minutes. And he held the line for 30 minutes by himself before he was killed. And it's like one thing to read what it's like to fight for 30 minutes straight. It's a whole other thing to fight for 30 minutes straight. And so literally for 30 minutes straight, these instructors attack you, and you have to defend yourself. And you cannot stop. I mean, when you try to take a breath. They will, they'll scream at you, they'll start pounding you, and you have to keep fighting. So for 30 minutes straight, you have to fight. And it's the most exhausted I've ever been in my entire life at the end of that 30 minutes. And it really gave me a much deeper understanding of what it's like when somebody says I was in a fight for my life or, or an actual fight like that. I mean, I've just never experienced that kind of exhaustion. And so today, as we continue in Philippians, last week we looked at verses 5 through 8. Uh, I'm going to talk about the death of Christ and what was accomplished on the cross because personally I have found in Christianity, and I myself have done this, we come up with what, what I've said before, that, that Christianese, right? It's like a Christian language all in of itself, that especially if you were raised in the church, you speak a certain language, but maybe don't really understand what that means. And so 
Typically, when I talk to somebody about baptism, is usually where I go really in-depth with an individual, and I say, what did Christ accomplish on the cross? And, and not that it's a bad answer, but the common answer is, well, Christ died on the cross for my sins. I say, absolutely, that, that's, a, that's a true statement. But what does that mean? Um, I think what happens is, at least I experienced this growing up in a Christian family, is I get used to the phrases of, yeah, Christ died on the cross for my sins, but to, to really dive into what that means, what, what did he accomplish on the cross, uh, takes much deeper Bible study. Um, and so I want to look at that here today, what, what did Christ accomplish on the cross? Now, there's a lot of different avenues, if you will, in theology you can dive into on the cross for, for whom did Christ die, uh, what was accomplished. There's all kinds of different sub-studies that we're not going to dive into today. Today we're just going to really look at what, what was accomplished on the cross. Because here's what we looked at last week. Um, I'll give a quick review, and then we'll look at the final sentence um, from last week. Again, it's verses 5 through 8. So Philippians 2, starting at verse 5, have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So again, last week we talked about how the Bible teaches that Christ is fully man and fully God. One person, fully both, at the same time. We looked at the verses that talked about how he is fully divine and never ever stopped being divine and how he was fully man and how that resulted in his death and how those two things seem like opposite truths and yet the Bible says they're true. And so through faith we accept what the Bible says as truth. Uh, hard for us to understand in our finite minds, but it's the way that the Bible describes the person of Jesus Christ. And why did he do this, and what did he empty himself of? Again, he, he emptied himself of the independent use of the authority that was always his as God, and purposefully humbled himself so he could no longer use those divine attributes just as he wanted. He would do it through the Father's will. He would submit to the Father's will, and so he took on humanity, added flesh, and was born as a baby and lived the perfect sinless life. And he died on a cross. So again, as we read here in verse 8, Jesus Christ became a man, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So Jesus Christ came to earth and died on the cross. He came to serve. We talked about that last week. Again, he humbly served. And we read some verses. I'll pick up on the last portion of one of the verses we read last week. It's Matthew 20, 28. The Bible very clearly says what Jesus Christ came to earth to do. Jesus was speaking at this point. He says, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. 1 Timothy 1, 15 says, it is a trustworthy statement. This is Paul speaking, writing a letter to Timothy. It is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am foremost of all. Why did Jesus Christ come to earth to pay the ransom for sinners, to die for sinners? So I want to focus on, focus on both of those things. One, how we are sinners, and two, what was accomplished on the cross. So let's start with how we are sinners. Again, in any true gospel conversation I've had with a complete stranger, I typically don't have to debate with people that they're sinners. Ask enough questions to an individual and they fully are aware of their own um, really evil in their own minds. Now, they, now everybody tends to think they're not as evil as somebody else because typically our measuring point is like, I'm not Hitler, therefore I'm not that bad. Uh, we don't measure it by the standard the Bible gives us. We measure it by human standards. Like, I'm not as bad as so-and-so. Therefore, by default, I must be kind of good. It's typically where the conversations go, but I've never met anybody that says, I'm just straight up a, a perfect person. Like, I've never sinned. I've just never met anybody like that. But what most people don't fully understand is the significance of that sin and the consequences of sin because sin is blinding, and therefore we're even blind to our own predicaments. 
So what does the Bible say about sin? Who's a sinner? Romans 5.12. We've talked about this before. But again, it's not always the same people here, and it's always important to be reminded of what Scripture says. Romans 5.12 says this, Therefore, just as through one man, talking about Adam, sin entered into the world, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. Now we're going to look a little bit deeper in different sections into Romans 5 and the treatise being written there. But because Adam sinned, the Bible says all sinned. All sinned, we've said this before, is an active voice verb. An active voice verb means that all did something, not all are something. That's significant. It's not just saying all are sinners. It says all sinned. Active voice verb means all actively participated. So when Adam sinned, it's as if each person that will ever exist sinned at that moment as well and are guilty of sin. Even before experientially being born and sinning, which we all eventually do and pretty early in life, we sinned when Adam sinned, and we can say that's not fair. Well, theology is what we would call imputed sin, because Adam sinned, we sinned. But just like because Christ died on the cross, we are saved, his righteousness is imputed upon us. So just like we could say it's not fair that when Adam sinned, we sinned, well, then it's also not fair that when Christ died on the cross, we were given his righteousness. But that's the way that God operates in his economy. And in a very poor analogy, it's really the way that it works. We see a lot of the things that happen these days, why police officers typically don't even act like police officers anymore, is because they don't want to get sued for doing what they were hired to do to begin with. And that's just the way that it is now. You do your job and you end up getting sued because everybody wants money. They know that if they sue a police officer, behind that police officer is a city or a state or federal government agency that will be held responsible. And therefore, financially, and typically, they know that it can get swept under the rug or something, and the government wants to move it along quickly, so they're going to get paid, right? We've all seen those stories and those scenarios. And, and certainly, there are times when uh, the officers and all those do things wrong. But for the point of this analogy is, if the police officer goes up and does something illegal and hurts somebody, who's held responsible? The government. That city is going to get sued, and the city is going to be the one paying. Well, whose money are they using? That's your money. You're essentially guilty, just like them. You're the one paying the price for that. It's your tax money going to that. And you're like, well, I didn't commit the, the act. The police officer did. Yes, but he's a representative of the state government who you voted or didn't vote for. Those people get in place, right? That's the way that government operates. And so essentially we do, even in a human standard and in a much less significant standard, operate this way on a daily basis. Sometimes you pay for things even though you really had nothing to do with it. We just don't think of it too often that way. And so when Adam sinned, all sinned. That means everybody's a sinner. The Bible very clearly says this too, everyone is a sinner by nature. It is what you are. You don't sin and become a sinner. You are a sinner, therefore you sin. It's what sinners do. It's because it's our nature. Ephesians 2, verse 3. Paul, again, and we've looked at this for those that were here when we went through the book of Ephesians, talking to believers and says, Among them we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath even as the rest. And so humanity, people, because of sin, are by nature, their core, who they are, children of wrath. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And so the Bible very clearly teaches that all are sinners. Now, you can debate whether the Bible is true or not, but that's the only thing you have at that point. You can only debate that the Bible's not true. And it's not written by God, but if you believe it's God's word, you really cannot deny the fact that the Bible teaches that all people are sinners. And because God is a perfect, holy, and just God, our sin has separated us from him. And in and of ourselves, we cannot do anything to change that position. We're dead in our sins. Dead people don't make decisions. Dead people don't get to make decisions. And so when you're born dead in your sin, not only can you not save yourself, you would never have a desire to save yourself. 
That is what, when we use words like total depravity, that's what it's talking about, that mankind is totally depraved in the fact that there is nothing a man can do. There is nothing in all of mankind that they can do to earn salvation with God. There is nothing that any human can do to repair their sin nature. They are dead. Therefore, there must be an acting agency outside of that death to bring life. The Bible describes us this way. Isaiah 6, 46. For all of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like filthy garment, are like a filthy garment. And all of us wither like a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind take us away. Romans 3, verse 10 through 12, as it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands, there is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. So again, we see from the beginning of time that Adam and Eve uh, sinned, and we've been separated from God ever since then. And ultimately, a consequence of our sin, we've, of course, talked about this before, and again, some of this is like, yeah, I know this, but we're putting all of these pieces together to talk about the death of Christ. Through Adam and Eve's sin, spiritual and physical death happened immediately. Spiritual death because they were no longer had the same relationship with God. It's why he kicked them out of the Garden of Eden. It's why they hid from him when, they, when God called for them back then. And physical death came, not just eventually for Adam and Eve, but physical death happened immediately after their sin. And it's one of those things that sometimes we just pass over because the Bible doesn't dive deeper into exactly what happens here. But you see in Genesis, when Adam and Eve sinned, what do they do? They hide, and they, it, the Bible says they sewn uh, fig leaves together. So they picked plants, they picked leaves, and they sewed them together to cover themselves. Well, that wasn't enough to cover what they had done. See, sin causes death. And immediately there was a representation, which is, built upon later in the Old Testament and the New Testament, but immediately something dies because in the next couple of verses it says that God actually gave them skin of an animal to cover themselves. So God made them garments of skin from an animal. How does he get skin from an animal? Because God killed animals and made an outfit for Adam and Eve. They sinned. They realized they were naked. God covered their nakedness, their shame, by killing an animal. We don't know what, we don't know exactly how that went, but right out went, but right out the gate we see the consequences of sin is the shedding of blood. Things die. We see it even a little bit later while again it doesn't go into super detail, we see it with Cain and Abel. Abel's sacrifice was an animal, a blood sacrifice as God had called for and Cain's was a grain offering which God had not called for. Abel did his in faith, Cain did not, and so God did not accept Cain's offering. The assumption is, and I believe it's a strong assumption, though the Bible doesn't say it specifically, that God gave them very strict instructions on the offerings that they are to give, and that Abel followed those instructions, and Cain said, I'm a farmer, it's really hard for me to get an animal, I'm I'm just going to give him some of my grain because that's what I've got. Now, again, does the text say that specifically? No, but I believe that you can read that pretty clearly in there. And the pattern continues throughout the Bible as to why our sacrifice is important. Why must blood be shed? Because that is the consequence, that is the price for sin, death. And so all of us, as sinners with Adam and Eve, deserve to die immediately. So why is death held back? Well, it's because of the shedding of blood. And in the Old Testament, God gave the people sacrifices as a representation for them to see how significant sin is. That God's just not ignoring the fact that we live in an evil world and a world full of sin. And we talked about this really in depth probably like a year and a half ago. I'm not going to do that again today, though it is pretty much a fascinating subject. If you want to dive deep, we're just going to look very briefly at Old Testament sacrifices. Then we're going to read a set of verses in the Bible that hopefully make a whole lot more sense from what we read in Philippians 2, as well as what we're talking about here with the Old Testament sacrificial system. So again, God says, listen, you are a people who sin. You turn your back against me. You have to have offerings in order 
to show yourselves that you have not met the standard that I have, which is perfection. And so there are five main offerings. We're only going to focus really on one of them. But again, there's the whole burnt offering where the whole entire thing is burnt up. There's the sin offering. And a sin offering, depending on your status and wealth, is a different type of uh, animal that you would bring, maybe a bull or a goat or lamb, two turtle doves if you're super poor, uh, things like that. But with the sin offering, this is one of the most important things about a sin offering. It's, okay, I sinned. I know I sinned. I've got to go to the priest, give them my sacrifice. They did this every morning and every night, all year round, every morning, every night to remind themselves. I mean, there was just always blood being shed. It's a lot of blood back then. And so they had to do this morning and evening, and they would go and they would hand over this object. But I want to read you the specifics about this in Leviticus 4. You know, the verses that we typically skip by, like Leviticus, we're like, that's that's just, I hit Leviticus, and my Bible study kind of just came to a screeching halt. Genesis was super, like, cool and interesting. Exodus was pretty cool, you know, but then you're like, I got to Leviticus, and it was like, I can't do another chapter. Look, been there. But the more we understand the Bible, the more especially Leviticus comes to life. I mean, one through nine, there's like a lot there. But this is Leviticus 4. Talking about a sin offering. Leviticus 4.27. Now, if any one of the common people sins unintentionally in doing any of the things which the Lord has commanded not to be done and becomes guilty, if his sin which he has committed is made known to him, then he shall bring for his offering a goat, a female without defect, for his sin which he has committed, and listen to this part, and shall lay his hand on the head of the sin offering and slay the sin offering at the place of the burnt offering. And so especially for sin offering, when you brought your offering, you symbolically every time laid your hand or both hands on the animal as a symbol of my sin that I committed is being transferred to this animal. And then you kill the animal. Because that animal, somebody has to give their life for that sin. That's the, that's the price of sin, death. And so God was symbolizing to them all the time, you are passing your sin on to that animal, and I'm not going to kill you, I'm going to kill that animal. And so the animal would die. That's the sin offering. There were then guilt offerings. Guilt offerings, just as a side note, you were not allowed to offer a guilt offering until you went to the subject in whom you were guilty against and made things right. Some versions will call it reparation offering in the fact that like if you stole something, you had to give back four times what you sold before before, what you stole before you're allowed to give the offering. I just think there's a lot of relevance that even today we're like, I'll just go to God and ask for forgiveness. Like I'm the person I offended, like, you know, God will work that all out. Eh. Old Testament system definitely says very different uh, reality there which is, of course, supposed to be a representation for how we do things in the New Testament as well. And so guilt offering was a little bit different, but you had to make things right between your brother and sister before you went and made your offering right before the Lord, which we see verses on that in the New Testament as well. Then there was fellowship offering, again, just filling you in, and then we're going to move on with our point. Fellowship offering was you, you didn't sin. You just want to bring an offering because you love God. You're like, I just want to go to the temple and tell him I love him, and I'm going to give him like some wine or my first fruits or grain or whatever it might be. You're just like, I love the Lord, and I'm going to go give my fellowship offering because I want to have fellowship with God. It's the only offering that you actually partook of. The other ones, either the priests ate what you gave and you fully gave it, or the whole burnt offering just got completely consumed and nobody enjoyed it at all. But the fellowship offering is almost like you're going and setting up a meal between you and God. And you're just sitting there in the presence of God saying, I love you. Thank you for being our God. Then there's grain offerings, not relevant to what we're talking about here today. Some other offerings, some things you can dive into, Leviticus and Numbers, but they're very fascinating. They have a lot to do with the New Testament. But here's the huge thing, okay? For the sin offerings especially, we've talked about this before. We're just going to briefly rush through it. What happened once a year for the Jews was the Day of Atonement. And that Day of Atonement was a huge, huge day. It's the day that the high priest made the sacrifices for all of the people. So the sin offering was, I know I sinned. Somebody made me aware of it or God made me aware of it. And I went and made things right. The day of atonement was for all the people for the sins that they didn't even know they were committing. They had done things outside of God's will. They didn't even know it, but God had spared them. 
And therefore something, somebody had to pay the payment. And so once a year, the high priest would go through. And we talked about the whole entire ritual before. We're just going to very briefly talk about what they would do. They would take the two goats. And they would cast lots and one goat would die and one goat would live. And the goat that would die, they would kill. They would get the blood. They would put it on the other goat, but then also go into the Holy of Holies. And this is the only time that anybody was ever allowed in the Holy of Holies. They would spread blood first before going into the Holy of Holies. They would light incense. Again, we talked about all that. But they would go into the Holy of Holies. And what the Holy of Holies is, is it's supposed to represent God's throne room in heaven. It's a shadow. It's an earthly representation of God's residence in heaven. He's in the Holy of Holies. Nobody gets to enter the Holy of Holies. Only the high priest got to enter the Holy of Holies. And only after he's covered in blood. He had to put on perfectly white robes. He had to bathe himself. He had to make a sacrifice for himself. Then for the people, there was a lot of things. Because if he's going to represent going before a perfect God, there had to be a lot of bloodshed. And there was, and he would go into the Holy of Holies and he would spread blood everywhere in the Holy of Holies to represent the bloodshed for the people so that another year would essentially pass and God would not put the penalty of their sin upon them but instead on that animal. Then they would go out, they would take that other goat. Again, it's called the scapegoat, which is where we get that phrase, scapegoat. They would take the scapegoat. Somebody would be assigned, take them way outside a camp. Sometimes they would just push them off a cliff because they want to make sure that goat never came back. But the representation was that all of your sins are forgiven. They are as far as the east is from the west. They're forgiven. They're gone. The payment has been paid. Blood has been shed, and the sins have been forgiven of the people. Now, of course, the problem is these are just animals, and so the next day when you went and sinned, you're walking home from Day of Atonement, and somebody cut you off in their wagon, and you're like that, bleepity bleep, and you're like, oh, back to the sin offering tomorrow, right? It's right back at it. You're, you're sinning again before you even get home from the Day of Atonement. And so, yeah, there was atonement through those um, through those animals, but is that enough? It's, it's just a shadow. The, the temple is just a shadow of God's actual residence, his actual holy of holies. So how could we ever get to the point of where we could confidently, sinful people, walk into the holy of holies, be in the throne room, and talk to the king of the universe? How could there ever be a sacrifice powerful enough, good enough, perfect enough for us to have that type of, of situation. If only the high priest, only one person, through a whole lot of blood, through a lot of sacrifice, through a lot of um, ritual, through a lot of gold, a lot of all this stuff, he's the only one who could even set foot in the Holy of Holies for a very short period of time, only to spread blood. How could we ever get to the point where we as sinful people could be right with God? Well, I'm glad you asked. Hebrews 9 has the answer. I'm going to read you literally the entire chapter of Hebrews 9. Turn there, please, in your Bible. I don't have it on the screen because I debated whether I was going to do this, but I really this morning was like, I have to. So hopefully putting together last week with how God is, how Jesus is fully God, fully man, talking about today, we are sinful, talking about that Old Testament sacrifices, I'm hoping and praying that Hebrews 9 gives a little bit more light and then we'll even continue beyond this. Here's what Paul writes, well, debatable, Paul. Here's what the author of Hebrews writes. I think it was Paul, but we could, for those of you that are astute biblical scholars, we can talk about that another time, but the author of Hebrews essentially wrote Hebrews, basically, remember this, book of Hebrews was written to Jews telling them, stop being Jews, okay? Stop living under the old system. A new covenant has come. And so this is what chapter 9 I'm praying that this makes a whole lot of sense with what we just read. So the author writes this, Now even the first covenant had regulations of divine worship and the earthly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle prepared, the outer one, in which the lamp stand and the table and the sacred bread. This is called the holy place. Again, we didn't get into all that. You can watch a different sermon. You can look up online the whole setup of the temple and tabernacle the way that it was. Behind the second veil, there was a tabernacle which is called the Holy of Holies. Again, it was a super thick veil that they had to go behind, the one that was torn from top to bottom when Jesus Christ died, symbolizing you now have entrance into the Holy of Holies. 
But behind the second veil, there was a tabernacle, which is called the Holy of Holies, having a golden altar on, of incense, and the Ark of the Covenant covered on all sides with gold, in which was a golden jar holding the manna, and Aaron's rod which budded, and the tablets of the covenant. And above it were the cherubim of glory, overshadowing the mercy seat. But of these things we cannot now speak in detail. Now when these things have been thus prepared, the priests are continually entering the outer tabernacle, performing the divine worship. But into the second, only the high priest enters once a year, not without taking blood, which he offers for himself and for the sins of the people committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit is signifying this, that the way into the holy place has not yet been disclosed with, while the outer tabernacle is still standing, which is a symbol for the present time. Accordingly, both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make the worshiper perfect in conscience, since they relate only to food and drink and various washings, regulations for the body imposed until a time of reformation. In other words, they had to go through all of these sacrifices, they did all these things, but we know that that did not make them perfect. It just covered some stuff that they did and that they broke in the law, but we know at the end of it, they still weren't perfect because they had to come back the next day and do the same thing. So he says, we know this was just a shadow of something else and it wasn't enough. Verse 11, but when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation and not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood. He entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling those who have been defiled, sanctify for the cleansing of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse, you, cleanse your consciousness from dead works to serve the living God? And for this reason, he is the mediator of a new covenant in order that since a death has taken place for the redemption of the transgressions that were committed under the first covenant, those who have been called may receive the promise of the internal inheritance. For where a covenant is, there must of necessity be the death of the one who made it. For a covenant is valid only when men are dead. For it is never in force when the one who made it lives. Therefore, even the first covenant was not inaugurated without blood. For when every commandment had been spoken by Moses to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of the calves and the goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant which God commanded you. And in the same way, he sprinkled both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry with the blood. And according to the law, one, must, one may almost say, all things are cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Therefore, it was necessary for the copies of the things in the heavens to be cleansed with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. So pausing there for a second again, he's saying, so we have the copies here, and these animals were killed, and it kept your flesh alive, but it really did nothing for your spiritual well-being unless you trusted God anyways. These are just rituals. They did nothing for you if you didn't have faith that God was forgiving you anyways. It was just a copy. However, a perfect sacrifice was given in Jesus Christ. Verse 24, for Christ did not enter a holy place made with hands, a mere copy of the true one, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor was it that he should offer himself often as the high priest enters the holy place year by year with blood not his own. Otherwise, he would have needed to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once at the consummation of the ages, he has been manifested to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And inasmuch as it is appointed for men to die once, and after this comes judgment, so Christ also, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, shall appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin to those who eagerly await him. What a beautiful set of verses. So what did Christ do? He was our substitute. He took our place. There's not just the laying on of hands saying, yeah, now my sin's being transferred. He, the eternal, perfect 
sacrifice took our sins away forever with one death, with one sacrifice, our sins were permanently removed. We see this in the Bible now. I believe it's up on the screens. We're going to look at 2 Corinthians 5.21. So I hope you understand partly now it's what Christ's sacrifice did as far as the sacrificial system goes. But let's talk even deeper about what the Bible says happened through, death, for, through Christ's death on the cross. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Again, this is showing how he was our substitute, that he took our place. Galatians 3.13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. So again, not only, as we read in Philippians 2, verse 8, not only did he humble himself to the point of death, but death on a cross. Why death on a cross? Because those who hang on a cross are cursed. So it's, again, symbolism that Christ became the curse that we deserve. He took our place. Where we deserve to die, he instead gave himself and Christ wholly satisfied God's righteous demands. So again, God's demand was for us to be perfect. We, we were not and we are not. So ultimately, Christ fulfilled God's demand, demands. And there is a Greek word that literally means fulfilling demands. It's called propitiation. It's not the easiest word to say, but it's propitiation. And the Bible talks about how Christ is our propitiation. So again, what did he do on the cross? He was our propitiation. He was a propitiation for our sins. He fulfilled God's perfect demands. We see this again in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 17. Therefore, he had to be, he had to be made like his brethren in all things. Again, talking about how Christ became a man, added humanity. Therefore, he had to be made like his brethren in all things, that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people, to fulfill the demands that God has. 1 John 4, verse 10. In this love, not in this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Colossians 3, verse 13 through 22, we looked at this last week. Again, we're just looking at one aspect right now, how he was our propitiation, how he fulfilled God's demands to be perfect. Colossians chapter 3, starting at verse 13, I believe our verses may start at verse 15 on the screen, but Verse 13, for he delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is also head of the body, the church, and he is the, he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself might come to have first place in everything. Again, for it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross through him. I say whether things on earth or things in heaven, and although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. So what did Christ accomplish? He fulfilled God's demands perfectly, and he reconciled us. Well, what does reconciliation mean? That's another benefit of the cross. 
So again, he was our propitiation. He satisfied God's righteous demands. He also reconciled us. So we read that word often in the New Testament. What does reconciliation mean? It mean it literally means to bring from enmity to peace. Again, we read in Ephesians 2, 8, and 3 that we are by nature children of wrath. We are at enmity with God. So reconciliation is taking an enemy and bringing peace. Romans 5, verse 10 through 11 says this. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled, we were brought from enmity to peace to God, through what? The death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only this, but we also exalt in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we now have received the reconciliation. What else did Christ accomplish on the cross? He took us from being enemies of God to being at peace with God. So he is our propitiation, and he is the source of reconciliation. He is also our redeemer. We sing that he is our redeemer. We talk about it. Well, what does that mean? This is what redemption means in the Bible. Its actual meaning is to purchase something from a marketplace. So redemption means to purchase from the marketplace. We were slaves to sin. Literally, the Bible uses word pictures that we were on a slave market and we were purchased from the slavery of sin to the adoption of Jesus Christ. And what was the price? Only one currency could work for that purchase. And it's perfect blood. It's the blood of Jesus Christ. He is the only proper currency that could buy us from that marketplace. The only way we could be set free from that slavery is from being bought. And so that's why in Revelation 5, 9, we see this. And they sang a new song. This is in heaven, saying, Worthy art thou to take the book and to break its seals. Singing about Jesus Christ, of course. Worthy art thou to take the book and to break its seals. For thou wast slain and didst purchase for God with thy blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. He purchased us with his blood. 1 Corinthians 6.20, For you have been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. You know, I, I often see things like, uh, you know, Christianity is, is easy or this, this free gift. It is a free gift, but it's free on our end. Jesus Christ had to humble himself come to earth, take on all of our sin, feel all of the pain that we have ever felt, all of the remorse, all of the shame, all of the guilt that we have ever felt and took that on the cross. But not only that, in the moment that he died and took on all of our sins, he felt the eternal consequence. How that works, I don't know. But him being God, he was able to handle it. He felt the eternal condemnation, felt the eternal consequences of your damnation. He took what you deserve, eternity in hell, and took your place. That's the price that we were bought. So he is our propitiation. He is our source of reconciliation. He is our redeemer. What else was accomplished on the cross? These are all different ideas in the Bible. He is our source of forgiveness. So again, looking deeper into the Greek words, right? Forgiveness is a legal term. It's charges that have been brought against you. And forgiveness is when those charges have been removed. You're taken to court, you're being charged with something, and those charges have been removed. So in the negative, they have been removed. We're going to talk about in the positive here in a second with justification. How do we know that Christ is our forgiveness? Colossians 2, 13 through 14. And when you were dead... When you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions. Having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us and which was hostile to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. You were guilty. In the most important of all judicial hearings, you were guilty. And Christ removed that guilt. He removed those charges. Not only did he remove those charges, 
but he also justified us. So while forgiveness is the legal term that removes charges, justification is the positive side. It's being declared righteous. So it's not just that you're not guilty, it's that you have Christ's righteousness imputed upon you. It's almost like walking into, in a very distorted way, walking into a courtroom for a heinous, heinous crime, like a war crime. You're being charged with being a guard at a Nazi prison camp. And not only are the charges dropped, but actually there's like a general who set the place free that actually goes in and tells everybody, not only was he not a guard, he was with me and secretly setting people free the whole time. So you walk in guilty and walk out the hero. Except where that completely breaks down is that we did absolutely nothing. We were actually guilty. We were the guard at the prison camp. We were guilty. But Jesus Christ, with the authority that he has, comes in and says, I'm removing the charges and I'm declaring him righteous. And the righteous, perf- perfect, holy, just judge, God, says, that is fine, but there must be a payment because I am just. And Christ says, yes, I'm that payment. I'm taking the guilt. I'm taking the punishment. So I will take all of the nastiness that you deserve, and you're going to get all of the goodness that I inherently have because I am God. And that's what Jesus Christ did on the cross. So he is our propitiation. He is our source of reconciliation. He is our redeemer. He is our source of forgiveness. He is our justifier. And he is also our means of adoption. Galatians 4, 1 through 5. Now I say, as long as their heir is a child, he does not differ at all from a slave, although he is owner of everything. But he is under guardians and managers until the date set by the father. So also we, while we were children, were held in bondage under the elemental things of the world. But when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, in order that he might redeem those who are under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. So not only did he meet the demands, not only did he purchase us with his blood, not only did he bring us from enmity to peace, not only did he remove all charges placed against us, not only did he place his righteousness and his goodness upon us, He ushered us into the actual kingdom of God as children of God. He adopted us. He brought us in. John 1, 12 through 13, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were not born of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Through Jesus Christ, we are children of God of God. It's truly not an exhaustive list of what Christ did on the cross, but I really do hope and pray that you gathered a deeper understanding of what Christ did on the cross. When we read simple phrases like he humbled himself to the point of death, even death on a cross, there is so much behind that. And I don't want us to just get used to saying things like, yeah, he died on the cross for my sins. He did all of those things that we just said, and we totally don't deserve it. I want to close with this verse. If we had read on, I mean, you know, read the book of Hebrews. Some difficult passages, some confusing stuff. You got to be, you got to really study it well. Make sure you're reading things in context. But if you kept reading on from Hebrews 9, if you, I do this, listen, when I was in the pew too, I used to do it too. I find some part in the Bible, I'm like, this is interesting, I'm just going to keep reading. And you ignore everything the pastor's saying, and you're just reading on, and then you look up and you're like, I don't know what he just said, but this was interesting stuff I read in the Bible. So if you kept reading on into Hebrews 10, now we're both caught up, because I want to read something from Hebrews 10. Hebrews 10, 19 through 25. Since therefore, brethren, we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, not in ourselves, by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil, that is, his flesh. He veiled his glory by taking on flesh. 
And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who is promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So after this long treatise of who Jesus Christ is and what he accomplished for us, he is saying, don't stop gathering together, church. Get together, remind each other of who Christ is and what he accomplished for you, that we are free and we should worship and grow in that freedom, looking forward to the point when Jesus Christ presents us holy and blameless before a perfect God and only holy and blameless because of his death on the cross. But you only gain the benefit of that if you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you believe in him. And I pray for anybody in this room, if you do not know who he is, and if you have not taken him as your personal Lord and Savior, that today you would, that you would understand your desperate need for a perfect Savior, that you are a sinner separated from a holy God, and that God chose to humble himself, to add humanity to himself, to be born of a virgin, to live a perfect life, and to die on the cross for all of the benefits that we just read and infinitely more so that you can be forgiven and spend eternity with God the Father and Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, and all those who have gone before us and all those that will follow after who believe in him. We will have perfection forever because of Christ's death on the cross. I pray if you have not accepted that truth that today would be the day that God breaks your heart open and you would receive this as truth. Let's close in prayer. Dear God, you task preachers with preaching. And Lord, many times I fill the air with my own words. They're just fluff. God, today I pray that we filled the air with your word with your truth. It is a true two-edged sword where it can cut to the deepest core. And I pray for those in this room that do not know you that today your word cut through everything and they saw the truth of who your son Jesus Christ is. And today would be the day of their salvation, that they would come to repentance and they would accept Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. Lord, I pray for those of us that know you that this would encourage us and remind us of just how precious the cross is and how far Christ went, how he humbled himself from perfect unity with God the Father and the Holy Spirit, Lord. Perfect unity with you, he stepped down, gave up all that he was rightfully his to submit to your will to die on the cross for us, Lord. I pray that we would never look at that lightly, never take that lightly, where we were purchased with such a deep price. May we glorify you in our bodies. In Jesus' name, amen. As we close with this song, God, you're so good. If you're able, please stand as we respond.
close in one second. I'm just going to ask you all to be seated just for a second. Can the elders stand up, please? Sid's over there. Andrew's up in the balcony. There's Sid. Where's Dave Rhodes hiding? Oh, he's in trouble. I knew I was going to do this. Bruce. Where's Bruce? He's down with the kids. Well, this was the bad time to do this. Sean's not here either. Uh, but... Jordan, you stand up too. 
Um, just stand up, Jordan. I'm not recognizing you. We, we've been over this. We don't do that anymore. But very serious thing. It's only through the name of Jesus Christ you can be saved. It's only what he accomplished. If there is anybody in this room that truly today feels like for the first time ever, they really understand their plight, their sinfulness, and their need for Jesus Christ. And God worked on your heart and you're ready to accept him. I ask that you would either talk to me or one of these gentlemen after service. I'm sure they all have things to do. We all have things to do. But there's nothing more important than clarifying that moment with anybody that's having that happen in their heart right now. And so if the Holy Spirit's working on you, come to one of these men. Come to myself. Talk to us. If we need further time, we'll set up a time to discuss that further. But I don't want to pass that up. Everybody else, go ahead and stand. If you're able, I'm going to close again with Aaron's benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. You are dismissed. Thank you.